Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining on the first day after the the lockdown is lifted in India, and I'm very happy to speak about a topic that I have off late gotten very interested into, and but Horan has been very close to for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, it is about art, and we are going to speak specifically about Indian art today. Uh, and Indian art is very much evolving, and you all know that we have an 8,000 year old uh, civilization. Uh, but uh, talk, uh, when we talk about the, the art specifically, sometimes the price and the value is not reflective of the rich cultural heritage that India has. So we've been exploring this, we've been researching about the evolution of Indian art uh, over the last few years. And you know, over the last couple of years, we've been specifically speaking about uh, the success stories of Indian artists through the current India art list. Yes, uh, that list is not perfect, uh, but we wanted to be as objective as possible by putting a number uh, to the value of the art sold. And we thought the public auction uh, prices are the most transparent way to look at it. And uh, I'm so happy that we have with us the, uh, from the art list itself, uh, Mr. Paresh Mehti, who is number 20 in the list. And, Thank you, uh, Anas. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the fastest risers of the whole on India art list as well is a dear friend, and uh, I'm so glad to join today uh, with us. It's my pleasure, my pleasure. And uh, secondly, we have Miss Yamini Mehta from London. She's the former chairman of Sotheby's, and I can't, Rupert and I can cannot think of a better person than Yamini who can possibly give us a better perspective of evolution of Indian art uh, compared to other uh, uh, art from other global uh, other countries. Th thank you for joining us today, Ms. Yamini. Thank you for having thank you. me. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. And I've got Rupert uh, joining all the way from Oxford, literally stuck there for the last four months. And hopefully uh, uh, once the lockdown and the whole thing is over, he's also uh, trying to get, get into action in the next uh, three weeks. So thank you for joining us. I'm the MD of Foreign India. I'm very new to art, like most of you who are probably watching this. But uh, uh, this session hopefully will give you some perspective, uh, some ideas, and also will possibly make uh, some of your collectors as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. So over to you, Rupert. You can possibly take this over. All right. Well, look, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. And as the discussion says, the theme of today is, is it the right time to come and collect Indian contemporary art or Indian art in general, specifically Indian contemporary art? And um, just as a little way of introduction, so I'm the chairman of, of, and chief researcher of the Huron Report. I'm um, typically based somewhere between Oxford and Shanghai and often coming to Mumbai. Um, we've been sort of, Huron Report sort of started out 20 odd years ago by trying to tell us to work out who the top entrepreneurs in the countries are. And so we did the China rich list, we've done the India rich list. These are two sort of main focuses, if you like. And we've seen this huge surge in wealth creation. And that's something that has been, you know, frankly speaking, never seen the like of this in the, in the world, in the history of the world. So in China, in the last 20 years, they've created more wealth than any other country in the history of the world. And we're seeing very similar sort of statistics coming out of India as well. There's a, these two huge countries and um, suddenly going from, you know, uh, some of the smallest uh, you know, having a, a very small percentage of world GDP back in the 1970s, today to having really quite a significant percentage of, GDP, of world GDP. And this sort of takes me to the world of art. And so if there's been so much wealth created, and I'm specifically, I'm much more familiar with China, but we obviously have everybody today talking about India. Um, if there's been so much wealth created, then you'd expect that civilizations like India and China Five to 8,000 years of, of, history, of civilization history, you'd expect there to be a, a, a huge amount of um, um, art and the value of art to be quite, quite substantial. Now in China, we've seen, you know, from, I started the China art list probably 13 years ago. And actually, we just released it uh, last week and I did a webinar with the number one artist in China, uh, Mr. Tsurujo, just a, a few days ago. And the one of the themes that we're talking about is that we're trying to encourage through the art list entrepreneurs who've got money but they don't know how to set about uh, their art collecting 
because, and I can tell a personal story here, is I remember myself trying to work out how to collect art. You go to an, a gallery in, in Shanghai, this was, and I say, you know, sort of tell me about your artist. And he goes, oh, you must meet this, this young artist here. He's really amazing. He's, he's the future. And so I'm sort of very impressed. I'm thinking I might get it. And then I go to the next door gallery and he goes, ha ha, I bet he was telling you about that young artist. He's a load of rubbish. This guy is really good. This is the one that you should be collecting. And actually at the end, it's so confusing that I just sort of gave up and I didn't bother and um, start, start collecting. And I suppose the purpose of this India art list is as a, for an out, it's targeted at outsiders. So it's not targeted at the art insiders, if you like, um, but it's targeted at the art outsiders. And those who've got the ability to collect, but they don't really know how to go, how to start their collection. And it's a way of just using numbers. Now, this then, I, I spent about two years trying to come up with this concept. How do you rank artists? Because there is an argument to say that, you know, what, for example, what I might like and what Yamini might like, what Anas might like, you know, it's a very subjective thing, you know, and, you know, actually I might like something really cheap and Yamini being the expert might like something um, very particular and Anas, you know, in the rich list might just like something expensive. I don't know. But the point is, there's a, I was trying to think of a way to measure art. And um, I believe there is a correlation between the value of the art and the, and, and the quality of the art. And I, I suppose that's at the heart of what this whole um, Huron art list is about. There is a correlation. So, you know, um, Leonardo da Vinci's, um, work that went and sold at public auction for, um, what was it, 450 million US dollars or a Picasso that sells for the 100 million plus US dollars. There is a sort of, that's the most expensive works of art at public auction, but there is a correlation somehow probably amongst the experts, at least the people who wouldn't put their money behind it for the value of it. And so eventually it stumbled upon, and just finished this up, um, the idea of doing art auction prices. Now, I know you know, and I hope all our listeners, they know that the stock, the art auction industry is also pretty unregulated. There's a lot of problems. You know, people buy a piece of art, but they don't necessarily pay for it. It's somebody, in the words of a friend of Yamini and myself, and a guy called William Henry Tennyson, he said, it's like stock markets on steroids. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ramping, there's a lot of problems. However, despite all that, at least it's a publicly available data point and it's probably more reliable than using private art prices which are almost impossible to get your hands on so it's it's very imperfect it's not designed to be these are the best artists it's purely designed to help those like the people on the indie rich list who um, um who've got a lot of money and have come into a lot of money and um, recently to start collecting their own art and then there's a couple more little stories very quickly. So I went to, with Anas to meet a few of the India rich list. And I was quite surprised with Anas. I was saying, you know, that very few of them seem to have a really passionate interest in collecting Indian art. They had like a Hussein on the wall or, and, you know, one or two others. But frankly speaking, I was very surprised, if you like, at the lack, even though they had a beautiful house, a big house with lots of wall space, but at the lack of Indian art that they had around them. And so I suppose the second mission of this is to promote Indian culture and Indian art to these Indian entrepreneurs. And it's a way, if you can get self-cultural self-confidence, I think it's hugely significant to the country. And I think cultural self-confidence does in a funny way come from the value of your art. Um, you know, if European art is worth is, is regularly selling at 100 million US dollars, that gives Europeans some sort of cultural self-confidence. Um, US art as well, um, these are, the, 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 that, that, that does help with this cultural self, or this country's self-confidence, I think, if you can get, if you have confidence in the culture or in the art. And, and you know, just, you know, sort of the kind of thing is that if you then look at the top of the Indian art list, is uh, Anish Kapoor, who's actually based in London, and I've never met him, but I've seen photographs of him. I think Yamini probably knows him, um, being in London. You know, his work sold at the last year at public auction for six million US dollars. He is the number one uh, Indian artist alive. Actually, we only do artists who are alive today. 
So it's not, and at $6 million sounds like a huge number, a huge number. But to put that into comparison, the, uh, you know, in the world, that wouldn't put them in the top 50. Um, in the, you know, the number one actually in the world is uh, actually a British at the moment and a German. They're about the same. They, they sold, their work sold for about 130 million US dollars in the last year at public auction. David Hockney, based in London, and Gerhard Richter, who's an 88-year-old German. Um, they're, so they're selling for about 130 million. The top artists in China, um, Mr. Tsurujo, who I did a webinar with just uh, three, four days ago, and his work sold for approximately uh, 50 million US dollars. So 6 million to a lot of people listening sounds like a lot of work. By the way, we have to be very clear, this is not money going to the artist. This is just the works of their art at public, at public auction. And so my question is, let's, or my, my hope is let's try and make Indian art, Indian entrepreneurs start collecting more and more Indian art. And if Indian art, uh, through our art list can be promoted, that's great. We know there's a lot of other artists out there. Um, uh, but when you do it in one year, for the Indian art, this is the second year of an Indian art list. If you do it for one year, that's one thing. If you do it for 10, 15 years, which is what we've done in China, you start seeing trends. And um, pretty much all the good artists sooner or later will be, uh, uh, will, will have to see their work go to auction. So I, I, sorry, I've started a bit long there, but just to set the scene, um, I'd love to hear a little bit, perhaps just to pass the baton back to Anna's to start with, is to tell us a little bit about the development of the India Rich List in the last uh, almost 10 years now, and, um, and then just to talk a little bit about the India Art List um, specifically, and then we can um, go on from there. But anyway, I hope that this can help you as an Indian entrepreneur or a potential collector to um, understand who the top living artists are and that the the reason that we focus on living artists is you can take them out for dinner. <laughs> you, can, you can have a cup of tea with them. Uh, that's why it's living artists that we, we focus on. It's about people who are around today. Anyway, so thank, thank you very much uh, for that. Anis, I can't hear you, Anis. Uh, I think we lost Parejda earlier because I think he was having some trouble with his phone. Uh, so the... From, from an India rich list perspective, uh, uh, if you look at the evolution of the last eight years, uh, we uh, when we started off the India rich list, we were at about 100 people on the list. Now it has grown to become about uh, uh, 1,000 people, right? Right. So the, and we've been having very close discussion on how they see the art and you know uh, the evolution and so on. And quite quite often, I've seen the big collectors. Uh, they possibly are not. Uh, um, are, are still get into the, you know, uh, become very serious about collecting. You know, we've seen that trend, but we have also seen a trend wherein there is a uh, increased interest for uh, uh, investing more in the upcoming artists in India. Uh, so, but it's still uh, possibly a, a distant gap. I think possibly Yamini could uh, give us some perspective on how she has seen the evolution over the last uh, few years from a collecting perspective. Uh, yeah, maybe you can give a couple of points on that. Well, th thank you, uh, Anas and Rupert, for your wonderful introductions. And um, yes, I, I've been observing the Indian art market, both with um, my auction house hat. I, I was at uh, Sotheby's for about eight years, and prior to that at uh, Christie's for close to 15 years. So I've spent the last 20 odd years observing the Indian art market. And I think that, you know, that I, I agree with Rupert that there's a lot of room to grow um, in, in this marketplace. It still is a very young market. And, you know, just to compare to the Chinese market, for instance, people have been collecting Chinese art for hundreds of years, for generations. And there's, um, there's a tradition of connoisseurship and scholarship just throughout the ages. And, you know, in India, for in, at least in the auction space, for classical Indian art, um, you know, you've only been seeing separate Indian-based auctions um, for about 35, 40 years. And for modern and contemporary Indian art, at least in the international space, 
it's only been in existence for 25 years. So we're looking at only a very sort of small smidgen of, um, you know, art and values over time. And when, when, you know, we first started in this marketplace 25 years ago, you were saying the entire market might have been a million dollars. And, you know, from 1995 to 2005, that kind of went exponentially from, say, you know, an auction making half a million dollars to four million dollars. And it's been largely led um, in, in the modern and contemporary space by modernists. You know, th this is a group of artists who really came of age in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And, you know, afterwards, say around 2006, 7, 8, when there was this huge push, um, you know, with, with international collectors looking at the BRIC countries, so China, Russia, Brazil, India, that's when you started to see the influx of um, international collectors. But like what Rupert was saying, they would go to galleries and, you know, the, the gallery system was so competitive and, you know, that they, they, they <laughs> there was a lot of confusion too. You, you would say, you would hear, oh yeah, don't, don't go there, don't, don't buy that. And, and I think that um, has- it's typical mentality here. Our, Place. I mean, you know, that, that's one thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased to be on this panel with Koresh Maiti, who has probably a different perspective because <laughs> Thank you, we all respect him as, you know, as the, the successor to someone like MF Hussein today. Thank you very much, Yamini. Thank you for giving me that compliment. I'm really honored. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I, I wanted to jump right into Parejda next after what Yamini said. What, what do you think about what he said and how have you seen the evolution? And I, I must really say that I've been meeting a lot of entrepreneurs over the uh, last couple of years and almost all of them have your work uh, at their offices or their house and they're all very, uh, the, your sculptures there and your, your paintings there. Even the hotel that we, or, uh, hotels that we go to, we see your big paintings there. So you could have possibly seen the whole evolution. And from your perspective, what are your thoughts and what do you think about what Yamini said? As Yamini said, that uh, Indian art scenario is very, very young, especially the contemporary art. As you know, it just started, you know, uh, just not many years back. So that way we have enough space like when you were climbing up a tree, we, India just started. And we have just started maybe just 5%. 95% is still the vacuum and left. And people have really started appreciating. They are collecting. They're very new. A lot of them are quite old. Uh, they have a huge collection of Indian art. And uh, very soon, you know, uh, they will really have a proper Indian collection of art. But it is, I, I, my opinion, it is always better, slow and steady. So it is just started not to just jump suddenly to some conclusion and fall down immediately. So that way, they are very selective. They are very, very, you know, observant. They're looking at it and they're collecting. And it's, it's good, I think, that way and will not be able to sustain. That is very important that they are taking some time. Because sometimes very fast when you want to do something that there can be a wrong decision. So sometimes you take, sleep on it, look at it, observe it, think of it, then you decide, and it's much better that way. And really, uh, people have started appreciating, they are going global, they are collecting, and we have too many collectors in India, all over India. They are not only settled in India, they are settled all over the world. They have started collecting Indian art, and. Uh, like during this lockdown, I could hear that hey, I should buy what uh, they're at home two, two and a half months, maybe a little less. So they have enough time to think about what is there now. 
because art you know there is something it gives a lot of happiness and pleasure and that is the food of your heart so they they are are uh, started uh, they have started they are going little slow but i think it's better that it is slow and steady so uh i uh think it's good to be slow and be steady lovely i can yes yes report no i was just going to say i mean thank you for that and and just to sort of to for those who are watching but haven't actually seen the list i mean um, on the list it is uh, anish kapoor his his work sold at public auction for 44 crore 6 million us dollars and then um, uh rameshwar bruta mr Krish, yes uh, rishan khanna yes uh apit yes. singh sakti berman uh yes and and, and and that but the numbers come down very quickly you know so we've seen you know mr kapoor's works as if they're selling a public auction for 6 million us number 2 is only one quarter of that it's like 11 crore or 1.5 million us and the number 3 is like 1 million US. and uh, and and i'm just commenting if you look at the uh, contemporary art the, the most valuable paintings sold at public auction and there might be stuff sold at private um uh, was a uh, paintings by francis souza and vs catonda and uh, i think sold both for uh, around the 4 million mark and for all i know uh, yamini it was you that actually uh, you know initiated those sales <laughs> i'm not sure um, yeah Um, but no i mean um you you because you're uh also dividing your report between living artists and artists who are no longer living it does kind of skew um some of those figures a, a bit but it does tell a larger story about um you know again how how much further contemporary art can still go and and i think that that's probably a positive message that i think i would give to any of my collectors is that um you know we we've seen sort of a, a heavy rise between say 2000 and 2008 and now it's like a, like what Parish might be saying is you know it, it it's a slow and gentle rise but i think um you know that there is definitely a, a lot of space to grow i mean your your report mentions anish kapoor and i think that you know we we caveat that a bit because anish kapoor is sold in and and marketed with a larger sort of international context behind him and and wh- whereas many of the other artists that you have in the list are not included in the large international sales and you know when when you see someone like Rameshwar Bruta um showing up as number 2 you know that that that's also a unique situation because that was you know a a, a, a situation last year where a private collection you know that had been put together in the 80s suddenly came on the market and so you had six major bruta works that were heavily competed for um to 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 come forward but you know this year it might be a little bit different it might be krishan kana or it might be some someone else that um takes that that top spot um that's right you know. that's right my my argument is that i i i with with i mean from an outsider from an outsider i look at india and one of the things i always think of india is very very strong culture and the cultural richness and an entrepreneur and an artist in a, in a funny way are both creating value an entrepreneur is creating business value uh, and an artist is creating cultural value uh, cultural richness whatever and, and and you could potentially monetize that put a money number on that but my my theory is that if we've got this many we got we found a thousand individuals in india with a thousand crore of personal wealth um that's that's a massive amount of money and you know if you've got that many collectors and you've got that rich a culture surely the prices that we're seeing today are 1/10th of what they should be today and, and you know i'm i'm saying to you that and um, with that many um you know you know with 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 that much money 
running around India with everybody will obviously start by collecting their own cultural stuff that they understand best. You know, we have seen entrepreneurs who like to collect just global, um, you know, global things, but that's maybe because they feel it's a status symbol. Um, you know, but if you're, if you're a successful, my, my idea is if you're a successful entrepreneur, you ought to be collecting art and in one form or another. And, and I hope that this art list can actually help you on your road because at least you can have an objective view. And I'm not saying that Anish Kapoor is the best artist in, in India by any means. I'm just saying that over the last year, his, his works have sold most expensively or, or brutal, whatever it is. So, so that, that's my, if you like, that's, that's, my, that's my hope that we can actually encourage more people to, 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 to come here. But my theory is that, you know, if the, the, the most expensive piece of Indian art that I understand has ever sold at public auction was this, this Pala temple, temple stuff you, you were telling me about. Uh, and that went for 24 million US dollars. And yet, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, it was a Leonardo da Vinci went for $450 million. Does that mean that European art is 20 times better than Indian art? If the most expensive piece of Chinese art went for 100 million US, I think it is at public auction, somewhere in, in those numbers, I haven't got the exact number with me. And does that mean that Chinese art is five times better than Indian art? <laughs> uh, I, I know, I'm, <laughs> but, but my, thing, my theory, if the most expensive work from India is only 20 plus million US dollars at public auction, it, that to me strikes me as ridiculously low for a country with five, thousand eight thousand years of civilization and with that many millionaires and billionaires and uh, they should all be competing over these top artworks and driving the prices up which is absolutely um, as should be and and the, the most expensive um, you know even say in the last hundred years with Francis Sousa or Vieska Handy both selling only for 14 4 million dollars only for an individual work of art it should be 40 million US dollars <laughs> I, I, I can answer that about the $24 million sculpture, um, the Pala sculpture, which is from the 9th, 10th century. I mean, I think for antiquities and especially sculpture, there are a lot of structural issues that we have in, you know, the Indian art market. And, you know, the, the buyer of that work is American. And that work is now at the Met. It's, it's on loan to the Met in New York. The direct underbidder of that work was Chinese. So, you know, it, it is a bit disappointing that, you know, no one from the subcontinent really competed at that very, very high level for, for that work. And I would say that w with religious sculpture, you know, you have to keep in mind, too, that um, it, it still is a living tradition and, you know, a sculpture that's broken in some um, families, can be, it can be seen as inauspicious. And that's something that um, it is very difficult to overcome. You know, it's like in China, um, you know, when I first started in the auction world, we were constantly seeing Tang pottery on catalog covers. And today I can't remember the last time I saw a Tang pottery uh, sculpture on a catalog cover because, you know, with the influx of Chinese collectors, you know, it, you, you see that that was actually something that appealed more to Western collectors. And in this particular case, the $24 million sculpture, um, it was still largely international collectors who recognized the value and importance of, um, you know, how rare that, that piece was. But I, I think, you know, that there are other structural issues too with why you're not seeing Indian art on the same trajectory as, say, Chinese art and, and uh, as, say, you know, Russian art. And I think I, I would like to say that partly that is, um, you know, education. You know, you're only now starting to say, oh, well, people are looking at value in these works. And so they're now educating themselves. But they didn't necessarily learn about it through school, you know, through electives in universities, through going to museums, that sort of cultural um, attitude and is shifting now. And especially as now people are sending their children abroad to um, you know, schools and universities. So th that mindset is broadening. But also another aspect I think is you know, the lack of space, 
the joint family system where, you know, people live in intergenerational households, which kind of me, which I often say too, where a lot of the early collectors in this market were largely self-made. And when you're self-made, you don't have anyone telling you what you can put into your house and how much you can spend on it. And I think that will change over time. One other point, I mean, um, point on this is, is it something to do with the Indian art auction market? Because when I, when we were doing this research, um, we, and, and it, it was quite a big research project, and we were looking at, in, in the world, top three art auction markets is the US, and then China mainly from Hong Kong, but Beijing has come up a lot. Their art auction market is strong. And then London. So the big three are in that order, US, China, and UK. And if you look at the most valuable artists alive today, whose works, you know, they're, they're, they're based on our, on our global art list, which I'm actually going to put out, putting out in the next few weeks, and the number one is Americans. In terms of the number top 50, 17 and 18 are Americans. Number two are Chinese with 11. Number three are, are British. And an, an Indian art auction market is only, I think in the world, it's, it's, it's certainly below top 10. And it has a very, very small percentage of the total art auction uh, um, uh, number. So perhaps one secret or one way of driving up and, and, and not driving up the value one way of getting people to recognize the value uh, of the more auctions in India <laughs> and to develop the Indian art auction market. Because it seems to me, again, that for a country with the richness of culture and the history and, and for it only to have a, not even to be a top 10 player in the world or art auction is, 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 um, is a huge opportunity for somebody. I agree. I agree on that point. And, you know, we are starting to see um, both uh, live auction formats and online auction formats developing in India. Um, Kandol's auction house is very, it's, it's probably a more traditional auction house with, you know, doing um, books, antiquities, uh, as, as well as modern and contemporary art. Saffron Art is another um, auction house that has now um, had its 20th anniversary this year. And you know you, you have an auction house in um, Dubai called Artiana, which is more of a again an online space. So they they are starting to develop, and I think the one of the reasons why auction seems to work very well is that um, you know it's confidence in pricing. People want to see who's bidding and that there's an underbidder, especially when you don't have as much. Of a, of a knowledge um, base to draw back upon. And so, I mean, you know, again, it, it goes back to the fact that we're still in a very nascent period. But I do think, you know, again, too, um, what we'll probably see in the next 10, 20 years is, you know, an explosion, hopefully, of um, collecting that will, that because, you know, what you're seeing with a lot of the entrepreneurs that you put on the list is that, um, some of them are second, third, fourth generation wealth, and others are newly wealthy and new, um, new, newly onto this list. But with a lot of that, it means, you know, like with India, it's coming out into its own. So part of it is, you know, it, it's aspirational. First, you make sure, you know, you, you have the house, the car, the jewelry, the home. And, and, you know, art then kind of comes afterwards and it becomes that one aspirational thing that kind of sets that collector aside from their neighbor. And I do think that that will happen. I do see, for instance, initiatives from um, people like the Reliance people who are really looking at the India art space and trying to see how they can contribute. And and you know that that's something that you know it, it, it's a young new generation that will come in with um, fresh ideas. I was on a panel once with um, one of the um, Ambani Skyons, and she she mentioned you know she she studied abroad and she said that it, it's interesting looking at museums in India and not really seeing the best of the best of the international and Indian contemporary art in the museums there. So that. And I, and I wonder too, maybe that might be her avenue into um, 
building something that um, you know that lasts in in the Indian in the in Indian art space. But that you know that's like dipping one's toes in at the moment. Um, Marish, may, may I ask you, um, how do your collectors find you, and is it through friends and friends of friends? Today, today I imagine that, or are you represented by a gallery and you, you work through a gallery system or, 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 or is it that you know, sort of um, you, you, you meet people and how, how does it work um, for you and perhaps also some of your other art, art artist friends? How, how do they go? It's the last uh, 30 years directly I'm involved in art. For years I have started. I have had 81 solo exhibition. All 81 solo exhibition I have had worldwide through my art galleries, situated different parts of the country and world. I believe the gallery and the artist co-relation is very, very important. And uh, if I'm painting, see, I cannot go and ask somebody to buy my painting. I cannot be a businessman. I am an artist. Let somebody do the economics. So it's very, very important for any, you can say the promoter, the gallery people to promote your art. I believe in that. In fact, many, most of my, like any meetings with even uh, press or anything, it takes place at the gallery. Because I don't entertain anybody to my studio. I don't like at home or anybody. So it's, I believe very much the relationship. Like I'm, let's say, locked down painting at home. And maybe the collectors are asking. Uh, yesterday was somebody was asking from Singapore to my one gallery that if I have one watercolor, old watercolor. So it's very important. And now while I was doing that, I was doing one watercolor. Now, if I'm attending that call and doing that, so my attention is diverted. So I can't concentrate with the art. So it's, I don't believe in that. I never had any exhibition of myself, always through galleries. So gallery and artist relationship, if you see the Picasso or Van Gogh or many other artists, they always had Anish Kapoor. When I traveled 30 years back to London, I saw his art. I did not know who he was and in Lishon Gallery. Still, I can see that he is with the Lishon Gallery. I, I appreciate that. I met him personally many times. I appreciate uh, people's, you know, loyalty. And that's very, very important to go uh, together. And growth should be together and growth should be together. So that's very important. So they ask, and sometimes uh, some people in a you know social gathering they ask, oh, I want one of your painting to collect. I said, um, where are you located? If you are located in Mumbai, Delhi, or in Dubai or in Singapore, so there are the galleries. You please connect them. They will get you the best of offer. Communication will be good. They can you know give you the certificate. They can tell you the history and all this. It is very difficult for me to provide all this. So I believe, and they really, but sometimes there are some unavoidable situations, like maybe one out of 100, they ask really, I want to do a special commission work for a specific space. Sometimes in that, those cases, I go and visit the space because maybe I need to see that area or maybe it's outside, maybe a sculpture or a mural. So in that time that, you know, the direct connection happens. Otherwise, always through galleries. And I believe that. And Parish, there's a little follow-up question to that. You know, Yamini has mentioned a little bit about, you know, sort of more formal museums and also more formal found art foundations. You just mentioned the Reliance Foundation, for example. But yes. how do you see that the national side of these, the, the, the national museums um, are, are, are going about collecting art and, and promoting, you know, sort of, uh, I'm not very familiar with how, uh, which, which museums are active in the contemporary field, but uh, 
Do you find that you're being collected or some of your friends are being collected now and, and, and chased down by the, 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 the top museums and art foundations? Yes, yes. The Art Foundation and the National Museum, or National Gallery of Modern Art, they collected. But before all this collection, I was, you know, hearing Yamini very clearly that first of all, we need some very important contemporary art museum like MoMA, Guggenheim, may not be that big, at least to start with that in every, because as you know that India is such a big country. So we need one contemporary museum in South, one or two, maybe in Bangalore, Chennai, one in Calcutta, Delhi, Bombay. What happens? Very often I have noticed during the summer, now that everybody is locked down, they can't travel. They travel, oh, I have been to MoMA, I have seen Picasso's painting. Now I ask, have you been to our National Gallery of Modern Art? They ask, where is this? <laughs> where is this? They, because first, the charity begins at home. If there are museums, as we have started our conversation that it is a very, very new society to collect, to promote Indian art. So we need to have such museums. See, two years back, the very international standard museum established in Patna in Bihar by Maki Associates. It's a huge, big, beautiful museum. They have contemporary section. They have also a lot of folk art. As you know, the India is very, very rich with the folk and traditional art. And we have, as you all talked and know, more than, you know, some thousands of years, our, you know, history and tradition. The first to establish the museums. The moment the people, they, the museums are here, when they travel here, they want to go not only to, you know, Kutub Minar or Red Fort or India Gate or so and so places. You know, after some time, they also want to see some museums, some art, some culture, some all this. So once that is established, I am sure there will be a lot of foundation will come up. There are few, there are few. And once that is set up and developed, that new generation, which is started collecting, they will really collect Indian art in a big way. And as I said that we have enough space to climb up. We have not climbed the top of the tree. We have just started climbing the tree. And so it's, there are foundation, as she said, Reliance Foundation, and there are Kiran Nadar Foundation, as you know, many such, you know, foundation, but we need many more, many more, because India is so big. You know, sometimes it takes four, four, uh, 4,000 kilometers to travel the country from one side to another side, from down north to down south. So we need museum, at least 10 contemporary museums in 10 different places. People will be educated, they will go, to the museum, they will, they will take their children to the museum, then they will get encouraged to start foundation, they will invite artists, they will invite curator for their collection, and you know, many such things will open. Um, one, one more question, and perhaps um, I'm aware of time running out, but um, when we looked at the analysis, we did some analysis of the top 50 artists, and we found that uh, most of the artists uh, significantly live in Delhi, so like yourself. And so, you know, the, the money capital, the entrepreneur's capital is in uh, Mumbai, there's no question. Something like 30% of the uh, who are in India rich list, they live in Mumbai. And yet the artists, they choose to live in Delhi, which is quite interesting. If you compare that to China, so significantly all the artists, like 60% of the list, live in Beijing. But, and, and Beijing is the, 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 the wealth center, if you like, also. So there is a correlation there. But the artists choose to live in, in Delhi, number one. And then the second thing is that when we looked at the artists, where they were born, uh, their place of origin, it was where Anas comes from, which is um, Kerala. So, Kerala, that's right. I come so, from Calcutta, Bengal. Yes, and then it was Kerala 
and then Maharashtra and then West Bengal. So those are the sort of the three areas that created the most artists, but in terms of where they live is ending up in, in Delhi. And so again, I, I don't know if Anis, you want to make a comment on this about what is it about Kerala, Kerala food, Kerala soil, why does it create so many artists? Maybe um, uh, Inis Yamini can comment on where the origins are and why pe where, where people come from and, and, and why people, and then maybe Paris, you can say, why do you choose to live in Delhi if you come from um, Bengal? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, so much of an expert in terms of uh, speaking about the origin of art from Kerala, but I can definitely say that uh, Kerala is one of those societies where there is a, uh, a coordinated approach between the artist and the government and even the localites uh, to promote and uh, talk about Indian art. Uh, so the, through the, uh, through the, the Miseris Binale uh, Biennial, which has happened over the last so many years. Um, so, and that is a huge spectacle in itself and it happens every two years. And it's a big coordination between the government, the people and the artist. So there is an exposure or a inherent encouragement from uh, uh, in, in, in the Kerala society when it comes to art. Uh, that's one thing that I can definitely see from a Kerala perspective. Maybe may, uh, Yamini and uh, Parajda can ask speaks uh, much yeah, better. Like Ramachandran and stuff like that. So. Uh, Ravi Chand, yeah, Ravi, Raja Ravi Varma, I know. Uh, there are, historically also there have been quite a few uh, uh, top artists from Kerala. But then this is a very new thing, you know, uh, the Binali is a spectacle that still happens up once in two years in Kerala, the only thing in India which so, speaks so deeply uh, from an art perspective. Maybe Yamini, you can speak a couple of lines on. Is, is, there, is, is that, does that make sense, Yamini? I mean, that, that Kerala would be towards the top, you know, Kerala, Maharashtra and West Bengal. I, I think that, you know, especially with younger contemporary artists, you do see a lot of um, support for um, for, for artists academies, uh, you know, that there was in Kerala, the, um, the, the, there was a cafe, for instance, that really helped promote Carolan artists to, um, you know, international clients, international collectors and galleries who would come to Kerala and basically pick out some, uh, you know, as they were graduating from art schools. I mean, I think what I mean, and, and, you know, Parish can also expand further is that at least in the 20th century, um, you know, the early part of the 20th century, Calcutta was actually a, a really important breeding ground for artists and because of the academies. It was there. a art capital, yes. Yes, it was. But, you know, it was you, capital, you, have, yes. you have to have the kind of that balance between, um, you know, where, where you find the artists, where they're educated and, you know, whether it was in Calcutta or Delhi, or you know, say say Bombay, places like the JJ Art School or Baroda. These are some of the main academies where a lot of the top artists have been um, trained and educated. But then you also have to look at space. I mean, for instance, I think I, I and, and again, you know, Parish, you you live in Delhi, but uh, where, as I said, it was not my destiny. Uh, it was sure. my destiny to come. To Delhi, but uh, it was not my intention. Um, I mean, you know, when I when I visit um, artist studios in Bombay, they're usually on the outskirts, and I think that um, you know to have a studio and a setup, and especially for doing larger scale works like sculpture and installation pieces, you you kind of need um, that that's a space that it's very hard to come by in. Cent in the central parts of these cities. But, um, you know, I, I think that- Space. <laughs> space is a big thing, but I also think too that right now there seems to be a fairly even um, grounding between Delhi and Bombay where a lot of um, the strong galleries are. And Calcutta also has um, two or three very, very good galleries there. But I think that, um, you know, it seems right now too that artists are a lot more mobile. They don't necessarily have to stay in the places that they come from. Uh, no, th thank you very much. I mean, the, the, it's all news to me, but it's worth being aware of looking at the artist's origins and 
maybe there is a correlation between Kerala and creating a lot of, of, of top artists. Um, final comment just on the India art list this year is that when we looked at, we actually did a separate list to help people understand um, the artists, not just who are alive, but alive and dead. <laughs> the artists who are both alive and dead. And, and we, the, the top artists um, in India, like in China, are dead. And they, they, they've had their time. So um, um, Syed Raza, Sage Raza, um, who died, what, three, four years ago, and his work sold for 100, 100 crore. And in the last year at public auction. Um, uh, Francis Sousa, who we mentioned before, um, Bhupan Kakar, I'm, I'm not, and then Ram Kumar, Raja Ravi Varma, and so on. And um, they were the sort of the, uh, some of the top selling, um, well, the, the first two were the top selling artists. Who, but what's interesting to me again, it's all very contemporary. So if you take India's 8,000 years that we know of, or 5,000 years, and the top selling artists at public auction of Indian art, no matter whether it's contemporary or old or anything, is um, in the last year, are these Mr. Raza and Mr. Souza, uh, and then Kakar and Kumar, Varma, and that sort of thing. So uh, I know Varma is a little older, he's probably um, 19th century, effectively, uh, early 20th century. Um, so, but again, it shows that. Uh, there's, and there's a remarkable statistic here, you know, that 50% of the best-selling Indian artists um, in the world ever, um, in, in the last, sorry, in the last, in the last year, are actually alive today. <laughs> so that means that this generation of Indian artists is hugely Im important. And, and if you compare that with China and, and the world, um, so in China, it's something like only 10% of the artists, the top-selling... 100 best-selling artists in the last year at public auction, only 10% are alive, 90% are already dead. In India, it's 50-50. In the world, it's again, it's about 10% and, 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 and 90%. So this generation of artists like Parish Meti, uh, like Kapoor, some of the other people that we've mentioned, um, is it a golden age? Are these people going to create the value that, in my opinion, we should be we should be seeing. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to put that to Yamini or to, or to, or to Parish, but uh, it, it's a remarkably high percentage. So it's either that Indian art is totally undervalued, which is my posit, or this is the golden generation that 25, half of the top 50 artists uh, that sold at public auction globally in the whole world, ancient or modern, um, actually are alive today. What, what do you I mean, mean I, I have a point to make about that, too, is that, you know, when, when you also pare this down a bit further with the contemporary artists that you discuss, um, most of them who are at the top of that game are also quite elderly. So there isn't that much of a generational difference between, say, a Christian Kana versus a M.F. Hussein, in fact, or, or Sousa, they, they were, in effect, contemporaries. Oh, um, you know, re recently, uh, an artist named Satish Gudral just passed, and, you know, the last auction that uh, we had in March showed, you know, a huge um, uptick in interest in his works, in Mohan Samant, another artist who left India to live in New York. So I think, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily look at it in, in those terms, but I do think what we're also looking at compared to, the, to Europe and China is a much smaller much, um, age range. So we're looking at, again, the last century, whereas if you're talking about European art, you're looking at perhaps the last five centuries. So Chinese art, maybe the last two centuries. So it's only a small group of artists who um, are, are still the ones that we're looking at. And I think that does then give a lot more chance and a lot more um, room to grow. So I do agree with you. I still think very much that Indian art is largely, largely undervalued. Hmm. Harris, do you want to make a comment on that? About, um... It is largely undervalued. Yes, yes, it is largely undervalued, and 
as I said, that it is slow and steady. And once it start, you know, going up, it will go up in a much bigger extent. Coming 10, 20 years, I could see that contemporary Indian art valuation and the pricing will touch the sky like any other artist from the globe. And I have a huge hope. Uh, and we have plenty of artists. We just don't have artists here or there. We have artists all over the country. As you said, that they're coming from here, but you may not know there are artists, such important artists, they're in Baroda, they're in Ahmedabad, they're in Pune, they're in Bangalore, they're in Hyderabad and many other places. And mm -hmm. just it is focused Delhi, Bombay or such like that. Mm -hmm. So, and one thing I wanted to tell you that as you said that why Mumbai? As you see that, you know, the most of the art Spain happening in New York. Well, that's the financial capital. So Bombay is also like our financial capital. So that's why, you know, everything, the economics happens, happens in Mumbai. But uh, the, as you see, the artists, they lived in Paris, they lived in, you know, Spain, they are from Spain, they are from, you know, Holland, they are from Paris. But the whole today, if you see last so many years, the major auctions are happening in New York. So that's why in India also, all these activities are happening in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And it is underpriced. It will grow up very soon. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in 10, 20 years, maybe 15 years, it will reach, it will reach the sky. Well, anyway, thank you very much, um, Parish. Anis, I'm very aware that our one hour is up now. And uh, I don't know if you want to make some summary comments, um, because uh, we, we told everybody it was going to be one hour. Um, yeah, uh, th thanks, uh, uh, Yamini and uh, Parishda. I just have one final question, you know, from a very layman term, and I'll stop it, I promise. Uh, let's say I'm very into collecting. I've never collected an art in that before. and and some of the works of Pareja is very expensive, let's say, from my perspective. Uh, but as somebody who is investing regularly in, let's say, a stock market or, uh, let's say, a luxury car or, you know, something like that, uh, what what would your advice be to that person when it comes to collecting Indian art, uh, both from a cultural confidence and also from a ROI perspective or uh, purely from a layman terms? Uh, I just want to know both your perspectives. Main, 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 sh main should be main should be emotional investment. When you buy a music CD earlier, CD it was not CD. Today there is no CD or cassette. That was mental pleasure. Art takes you to a different level of your mentality. You enrich yourself, but any other thing they don't enrich yourself. It is your mental food. So when you buy art, a piece of art, it is completely an emotional investment. When the economics comes, the yes, it will grow up this, that's a bonus. That's extra. Because art, something, it grows on you, it grows with your family, it grows with the generation, and you enjoy, get pleasure and happiness out of that. And that is, you cannot compare with any other, you know, investment, what you do, like stock market and all this. They are, the whole economic is different, but here it has many important things, which is the first thing is the emotional investment, love, passion, and you enjoy that. I, I, I can concur with Parish that I agree. You, you have to want to put, what you buy on the walls. It's not, I, I think that um, the best investor is actually a passionate collector. It's somebody who actually engages themselves and takes the time to learn about what they're collecting, why they're collecting, who they're collecting. And, you know, I, I know that the, the whole term ROI, it can be an anathema to 
you know, gallerists to artists, but I, I, I get it. I understand why, because it is, when, when, at the end of the day, it is investing money for a passion. But I, you know, I, I will say this. One of the most interesting art collectors slash investors I've ever met in the field is someone who has actually put a lot of time and interest and effort in reading the journals, um, you know, so quietly reading the journals, reading the magazines, um, subscribing to art news. And his whole methodology is fascinating. He, he basically uses the um, economies of the countries. He looks at it from a macro level. So this is a gentleman who started collecting Chinese contemporary art, sold his Chinese collection to buy, to buy Indian art, and then sold his Indian collection to buy Chinese art, then sold all of that to buy Southeast Asian and Vietnamese and Indonesian That's art. That's very interesting. And he, it's interesting because, I mean, he's the, the one investor slash collector who's made a mint in buying art, but there is still that intellectual passion by devoting himself to, um, you know, looking at, you know, the, the, the underlying art world. And now, now he's buying Mexican art as well. But his one thing is that once, an, once a work reaches a hundred thousand dollars or 150 and maybe it's gone up then he sells whereas for me i i can tell people what to buy and what i like but i i find it a hard thing to tell them when to resell in terms of a return on investment but i i do agree with parish might be too that ultimately i think that we should be looking at building an art um, infrastructure that's based on knowledge and passion and maybe not so much on investment. I mean, yeah. um, you know, sort of in China, or the, the, the Huron Report, we have a Huron Art Foundation, and we've been doing it probably for about six years. And so the theory behind the Art Foundation is a bit more Yamini, your concept is. The idea is that we're going to um, collect as um, this generation's art, and the idea is never to sell it. Uh, that's the idea. So it's a not-for-profit, and the idea is that you just collect the art of this generation. Specifically, we started out in China, we're about to launch in India. And the idea is to put, if you, because these countries, these great countries of China and India are coming up and, you know, in probably 20, 30 years, they will be number one and two in the world in terms of GDP. And, you know, uh, they have a very good chance of, of being that. And so to be able to, being engaged with the cultural side of it, not just the money-making side, but the cultural, which is all wealth creating, if you like, but in the cultural wealth side is, is, is our ambition. So is to bring it in, is, is to, yes, is once it's collected, it's never to sell. <laughs> but obviously <laughs> never doesn't really mean very much, but um, it's certainly that's the idea that we have. So that's our next big project for India. So anyway, thank you. Anyway, thank you very much for joining. It's been a, a, a big educational session to me as well. Uh, I have only recently started collecting. Uh, so it's a great session, I'm sure. People who have been uh, very new to art would find this very interesting as well as people are collecting as well. Uh, and I, once the lockdown is all over, uh, hopefully we'll all meet up in London and possibly do a physical uh, panel session on stage with some of the uh, collectors and enthusiasts at some point in time. Uh, but uh, thank you. Yamini for joining us from London. Thanks, Parejda, for joining us. Uh, Rupert, thanks again. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll all catch up soon face to face. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Bye bye. Thank you. Thank